This episode of Fine Scale Modeler's new product rundown features Tamiya's F35A, Ravel's BTR50PK, AMT's Enterprise C, Airfix's Little Buccaneer, Ravel's Porsche 911, Academy's F104, Ravel's Outlander TIE Fighter, AMT's 1964 Comet, MPC's Monte Carlo, and Toyota Supra, Tacom's Big Panzer One variants, and Ravel's A320 Neo. New product rundown brought to you by Hobby Zone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard to find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs. And by Cult TV Man's Hobby Shop, the place to go for science fiction and fantasy kits, details, masks, decals, and more. Welcome to New Product Rundown, Fine Scale Modeler's twice monthly look at the coolest new releases. I'm Aaron Skinner. And I'm Tim Kidwell. Let's kick off today's episode uh, with the hottest news out of the All Japan Hobby Show, which was held in September, Tamiya's 148 scale F35. Yep, it's another Lightning II, the third one we've looked at in three straight episodes. This represents the A variant used on conventional ground-based airfields and in use with many national air arms. Typical of the F-35 kits we've seen, the fuselage is split horizontally, with the upper half featuring slightly raised ram panel outlines molded in a slightly different texture. The lower half has the openings for the weapon and gear bays, with the underside of the nose separate. The horizontal stabilizers have thin leading and trailing edges, a feature mirrored in the vertical tails. The leading and trailing edge flaps are separate. Cockpit detail includes a tub with molded console controls, rear bulkhead, sides, controls, multi-part US-16E ejection seat, instrument panel, and pilot with the helmet-mounted display. Full intakes are supplied, ending at a separate front fan. At the rear, a jet pipe with molded detail also has a separate fan, and the nozzle ring gets layered feathers. Other parts sandwiched inside the fuselage are beautifully detailed front and main gear bays, the latter attached to a sturdy internal brace to strengthen the lower fuselage. Inserts behind the brace set the angle of the landing gear. The detailed weapons bays show wiring and plumbing, and many of the bay doors feature separate internal parts with the hinges that include part of the bay walls for positive alignment. A pair of metal rods detail the outer weapon bay doors. Loadout options include two AIM-120Cs and two GBU-31J dams for the internal bays. Optional pylons for the wings allow for a pair of AIM-9X sidewinders and four GBU-12 Paveway 2s to be added. Two gold tinted canopies and a pair of frames allow for the canopy to be changed between open and closed on the finished model. Clear parts also supply lights, sensors, and the housing for the electro-optical targeting sensor under the nose. Masks are provided. No less than four decal sheets are in the kit, including seat belt, panel details, and ordnance stencils, RAM panel outlines for the early and late versions of the coating, and markings for the F-35A from the U.S. Air Force, Japan, Norway, the Netherlands, Australia, Israel, Italy, Korea, and Denmark. So this is a powerhouse of a kit, and it will certainly be popular. I mean, how could it not? Going to ground small, here's Ravel's 172nd scale BTR-50 PK. Based on the PT-76 light tank, this amphibious armored personnel carrier served the Soviet military from the 1950s to the 1970s. This little kit is believed to have started life as a never-released Toxo tooling. The lower hull builds from a belly and suspension section that is topped by sides, the engine deck, and troop compartment. The running gear comprises road wheels, drive sprockets, and idlers that get wrapped with flexible plastic tracks. The amphibious propulsion system is represented by ducting. A small photo etch metal fret provides light guards and engine screens. To finish the tiny APC, decals provide three marking options, one East German, one Soviet, and an Egyptian vehicle from the 1973 Yom Kippur War. There's a lot of detail packed into this little box, and it should produce a sharp model. Heading into the future and the world of Star Trek The Next Generation, we have here a reissue of AMT's 11400 scale Enterprise C. The best one. <laughs> this Ambassador-class starship was only seen in one episode, 
yesterday's enterprise, but it's arguably one of the best TNG stories. This tooling dates to 1999, and this looks to be the first repop since 2011. Like most Enterprise kits, the C is relatively simple, starting with a primary hull split in upper and lower halves. Surface detail is typical of these Starship kits, with recessed windows and relatively deep engravings. The engineering hull has a slot to accept the pylon section for the warp nacelles. Clear plastic provides Boussard collectors and intercoolers for the nacelles, as well as the impulse engine and navigational deflectors. Optional parts allow you to build USS Yamaguchi, a ship that took part in the battle against the Borg at Wolf 359. A nice inclusion is the big dome stand with metal rod support. The big decal sheet includes registry numbers, ship names, and stripes, in addition to a large section of battle damage scars matched to sections of the hull, as indicated in the painting diagrams on the sides of the lower box. So this kit should be pretty easy to build and the fun really coming with the painting and the finishing. And I was remiss, it's the best one since the refit. So as Airfix launches its 148 scale Buccaneer, it seems like a good time to look at the company's second 172nd scale kit of the Blackburn Naval Attack Aircraft. This kit represents the S2B variant that was built for the Royal Air Force. You can read Mike Klessig's workbench review of the initial kit at the link in the description. The Buccaneer's unique shape makes for an unusual parts breakdown with the front split vertically, the center split horizontally with the upper and lower half that includes the bomb bay and part of the wings, which can be cut to pose the wings folded, and the rear with the vertical tail. The horizontal stabilizer, intakes, exhausts, and tail hook insert finish the airframe. Inside the two-piece cockpit incorporates a tub, rear bulkhead, ejection seats, pilots, and instrument panels front and rear. Short intakes attached to the front fans, and at the back, long jet pipes mount between bulkheads with molded engine details. Optional parts allow the distinctive air brake to be posed open or closed. Underwing stores include fuel tanks, a sidewinder, a pair of Paveway 2 bombs, a jamming pod, and Pave Spike laser designator pod. Clear parts provide the windshield and canopy, the internal windshield for the rear seat, sight, lights, and wingtips. Cartograph decals provide numerous instrument panels, weapon stencils, and markings for two RAF Buccaneers. A number 208 squadron aircraft in wraparound dark green and dark sea gray with options to mark it as it is preserved at the Ulster Aviation Society. And a number 12 squadron plane in medium sea gray and barley gray. Airfix has done a really nice job of capturing the Buccaneers' shapes and gives plenty of build options along the way. Revving up the show, here's Ravel Germany's 124th scale Porsche 911 Carrera 3.2 Targa. The last of the original 911 series, the classic sports car features a 3.2 liter six cylinder engine. The body featuring crisp details is molded in red plastic, as are the wing mirrors, rear bumper, headlight bezels, front and rear body sections, and the engine cover with open vents. Underneath that cover lurks a nicely detailed engine with block, transmission, intake manifold, fan, timing cover, and exhaust, disc brakes and the rear suspension, as well as drive axles and the front suspension, connect to nicely rendered wheels that are wrapped with rubber tires. Pay attention as they look the same, but are slightly different front to rear. All of that attaches to the underside. Inside, there's a floor and detailed side panels, fold down rear seat, front bucket seats with two styles of headrest and optional left or right hand drive dashes. Clear plastic supplies the windshield, side glass and backlight. Beautifully printed decals provide dash dials, speakers, mirrors, engine placards and labels, external and internal badging, fabric pattern for the seats and license plates for 10 European countries. Plenty of detail marks Ravel's Porsche 911. If you dig 1980 sports cars, you'll like this kit. Up next is Academy's 172nd scale F-104C marked for the U.S. Air Force during the Vietnam War. The sharply molded parts in this kit started life as a Ravel Germany tooling in 1995. Molded in two sections, front and rear, the fuselage has finely recessed panel lines. The thin wings are single parts, as is the horizontal stabilizer. 
Cockpit detail comprises a tub with detail on the consoles and a separate instrument panel and optional ejection seats. Although the intakes appear open to the interior, the intake shock cones will hide the void. Aft, the short jet pipe and nozzle are sandwiched by the external tail halves. The gear bays, legs, and wheels all look good for the scale. In addition to fuel tanks for the wingtips and pylons, stores include sidewinders. The canopy is molded with the windshield and there are clear lights and HUD glass. Decals provide stencils and markings for four starfighters a natural metal USAF aircraft at Da Nang Air Base in 1965, a camouflaged American F-104C based in Thailand in 1966, a Taiwanese Air Force fighter that shot down a Chinese J-6 in 1967, and a Japanese aircraft in 1984. There are lots of options here, and according to FSM's longtime senior editor, editor emeritus, Paul Boyer, who's built three of them, it's an excellent kit. From Ravel, Germany, we have the 165th scale Outland TIE Fighter as seen in The Mandalorian. The basis of this kit is the company's Snap Together TIE, first released in 2011. All of those parts are here, including the solar wings with separate internal frames, the two-part body that wraps around the multi-part cockpit for the pilot. A sturdy stand is also included. Most of those parts don't get used here, as there are new upper, and lower body sections. The latter has bays for the landing gear. The new parts clearly reflect more research as an updated tooling for a more accurate ship. Those accuracy fixes are also seen in the rear plate and the cockpit hatch. The cockpit interior remains the same. As expected, given the nature of the Outland TIE's folding wings, those parts come in halves with separate frames on one side. Thanks to optional parts, the wings can be posed in three positions in flight, partially folded as it prepares to land, and completely folded on the ground. Gear doors and squatty tricycle landing gear complete that look. Clear parts provide the windshield and the hatch viewports. The small decal sheet gives markings for the pilot and cockpit displays, and there are clear color callouts throughout the instructions. This is a fun model of a cool variant of the Empire's primary starfighter, and it's really nice to see that Ravel is, you know, upping its game and, and redoing some of the uh, parts in there. Now, this kit can be a little difficult to find on this side of the Atlantic, but it's worth seeking out. Now that we're up to speed, here's the latest in AMT's Craftsman Plus series, the 1964 Mercury Comet Caliente. Craftsman kits are easy to build curbsides, but that doesn't detract from this reissue of a kit that dates to 1964. The coupe's one-piece body is cleanly molded with crisp trim details and door outlines, a quick sanding to remove mold seams, and it should be ready to prime. The underside is a simple, single part with suspension, drivetrain, and exhaust detail molded in place. And the interior tub shows the seats and console. The only parts that need to be added are the dashboard and steering wheel and an optional dog. Chrome parts include the front grille and bumper, rear trim and bumper, wheels, and more. The clear parts fill the windshield, side vents, and back glass. Pad printed white line tires, new to this release, finish the vehicle. New here also is the sharp decal sheet with badging, dash details, wheel trim, and license plates. There are also decals for a car that took part in the 1964 durability run. This simple kit would be great for less experienced modelers to hone their painting skills on. From MPC, here's a reissue of the 125th scale Toyota Supra that first showed up in the catalog in 1983. The kit looks unchanged from that release with a one-piece body, optional body flares and hood scoop, well-detailed straight six double overhead camshaft engine, good interior, and optional wheels. Beautifully printed decals supply the colorful early 1980s body graphics, badges, and South Dakota license plates. Also from MPC, here's a 125th scale 1980 Chevy Monte Carlo. Titled Class Action, this kit first popped up in 1980 with parts for the T-top, Landau roof, and luggage rack. The parts are all here, including the engine, the optional wheels, the trailer and chopper motorcycle that have been part of the kit since the beginning are here too. New here are pad printed white line tires, and a sharp decal sheet with a bunch of pinstriping, badging, gauges, and license plates. If you like 1980s cars, you're going to want to have these in your collection. 
In early 2020, Tacom released its initial 116th scale Panzer I ALFS A. You can see our one-shot preview and read a workbench review of it at the links in the description below. Over the last couple of years, Tacom has re-released it with new parts, culminating in these two kits. A Kleiner Panzer Buffelswagen I and a Panzerjäger 1B armed with a 7.5 centimeter gun. The running gear and lower hull remain the same for these kits. The Panzer Buffelswagen elevated casemate builds from parts for each panel, including the top, that receives a pulpit. The radio antenna frame is a single part with separate uprights. A well-sculpted commander figure can occupy the upper hatch, and the decals provide markings for six vehicles in early war camo. The open fighting compartment for the Panzerjäger includes a floor and armor, as well as the mount for the 7.5 centimeter gun. An optional metal barrel is included, and a figure loading the gun is here too. Decals give markings for four German vehicles, all in Berlin in May 1945. If you like building big scale armor, especially stuff that doesn't take up a whole lot of room, these kits are for you. Also in 2020, Revell Germany released an all new tooling of the 1144 scale Airbus A320 Neo, and you can see our one shot review of that kit in the link below. The company's new kit of the airliner includes something not in the first landing gear with well molded legs and doors. Not called for in this kit, but provided are three styles of satellite antenna housings. The airframe has open windows and fine recessed panel lines and door frames. And both wings are full span. As with the initial release, both engine types used on the A320neo are here. Beautiful decals designed by Daco Products supplied stencils and the current British Airways livery. So I'm an airliner fan and this kit appeals to me and I'm sure it builds nicely. Look for reviews of the F-35, the TIE Fighter, the Enterprise C, the Porsche, and the Toyota Supra, the Monte Carlo, and the Mercury Comet on finescale.com. And while you're there, don't forget to enter the Build a Model Month contest. You can find a link in the description below. It'll take you straight to where you can enter. Submit five photos of your, your favorite model or models, and we'll take a look at them. Thanks for watching. I'm Tim Kidwell. I'm Aaron Skinner. We'll see you next time. AMT's 1964 Comet, MPC's Monte Carlo. I don't need to dress up. I go as myself. Ram panel. That's just a good band name. Big dome stand. Scat. <laughs> Pilots. Aft. <clears throat> Aft. Aft. The short jet pipe and nozzle or sandwich. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. There. You need a towel. <laughs> a gargle after that, perhaps? <laughs> you haven't been Next thing you'll tell me, Santa Claus doesn't exist. Oh, God, I man, that. I had the flow, and then you've like, burp, burp, burp. what? No, you broke it, dude. You're burning up Diane's day. In five, four, three. She can count. Two. Do they teach that in film school? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, Tim, you're burning up. I am. I am. I am. <laughs>